So we talk about systematic review and meta-analysis. So the question is, why is it important to, to, to perform a systematic review or a meta-analysis? And what is a systematic review and a meta-analysis? So a systematic review is uh, a review that is conducted according to clearly stated scientific research methods and is designed to minimize biases and errors inherent to traditional narrative reviews. So why is it mm, very important, this type of uh, uh, study design? Uh, nowadays, every day, um, I mean hundreds, I think studies are published about one particular topic and I think systematic reviews are very important to summarize what's going on in a particular field and uh, sometimes it's also uh, very good to try uh, to understand what is the true, if we can say that, if there are conflicting results among studies regarding one particular topic. So, um, systematic, a systematic review is um, characterized mainly by a quali qualitative approach, I would say, meaning that in a systematic review we describe all the studies that have been published on a particular topic, and sometimes we are able to pool the results coming from all these studies regarding one particular topic using particular statistical methods. In this case, we say we perform a meta-analysis, so we will not have just a systematic review, but we will have a systematic review and a meta-analysis. So we will have both a qualitative and a quantitative approach. So let's discuss what are the important aspects in uh, when we, we, we plan to perform a systematic review or a meta-analysis. First of all, the hypothesis must be conceived a priori, and this is a, an aspect that is common also with, for example, RCTs. There are four very important steps. The first one is to identify the studies to include in the systematic review or the meta-analysis. So we have to define inclusion and exclusion criteria, as it happens for all the types of study. We have to abstract data from the studies that we want to include in the systematic review or in the meta-analysis. And at the end, if it's possible, we perform statistical analysis. So this is the difference between having just a systematic review and having a meta-analysis. So both a qualitative and a quantitative approach. The literature search can uh, seem the easiest part of the work, but that, the truth is it's the most difficult part of the work. Um, the literature search strategy has to be defined a priori. It's not enough just to check PubMed, that's what I think we all usually do, but we have to check more than one database in order to be sure to include all the evidence regarding a particular topic. Sometimes it's possible also to use the gray literature, meaning, uh, I don't know, uh, for example, clinicaltrial.gov, that's an important source of data for, for example, for trials that have not been published yet, but results are already, data are already online on this website. We can also abstract data from abstracts from meeting, using other references to contact experts. Sometimes it's really useful, for example, to use references from other meta-analysis and so on. There is always risk of bias everywhere, also in systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Uh, first of all, the English language bias. Sometimes some studies are published in languages that are different from English, you will think it's not important evidence if it's not published in English, but still, you are performing a bias if you don't read also the, 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 the if you don't consider the results coming from studies not published in English. Then there's the citation bias, meaning that studies with significant results are 
more likely to be reported as, compa as compared with studies with neutral results. And uh, the publication bias, um, and the publication bias. So uh, data collection is a, another very important point. The variables of interest and have to be defined a priori, so a database can be uh, prepared and all the investigator will, will use the same uh, database in order to extract the variables from the, from the studies. Um, in this way, we are sure that all the investigators are considering the same variables. Uh, it's important that it's not just one investigator to, to perform the literature search. It's suggested to have at least two people working on that in, in order to have a reproducible and accurate literature search. And it can happen that sometimes uh, two reviewers are in disagreement about including or not including the study in the systematic review and meta-analysis. And in this case, the two reviewers can discuss and find an agreement, or they can ask a third person to, to, to examine the studies and decide if it has to be included or not. What, uh, what are the important variables to extract from studies in order to perform a meta-analysis or a systematic review? Of course, the study characteristics, meaning the year, the author, the, 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 the journal where the study has been published, how many patients are in the treated arm, how many patients are in the control arm, how long was the follow-up. Then it's important to, to describe the population, so to collect demographics and clinic, char clinical characteristics, for, for example, the traditional cardiovascular risk factors. And then, of course, if we want to perform a meta-analysis in particular, it will be particularly important to collect data about outcomes. For example, in a cardiovascular, uh, in, in a meta-analysis or a systematic review in cardiovascular field, it could be important to collect all cause mortality, cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, stroke, and whatever. Then it's, of course, a systematic review and the meta-analysis collects several studies. So the overall quality of this kind of study depends on the quality of all the studies that we are going to include in the systematic review on the, the meta-analysis. So it's important to assess the, qual the quality of the uh, studies included in, uh, in this uh, meta-analysis or systematic review. And for example, there, there are several methods to do that. The grade uh, method is one of the most used. And actually, it consists of giving a score to studies according this criteria. Uh, of course, highest is the score and, IS, uh, and higher is the quality of the study included in the, in the, in the meta-analysis or in the systematic review. Then, in some circumstances, but not always, it's possible, it's possible to uh, go from just a um, um, descriptive approach to a, to, 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 to a synthetic approach, to, to an analytic approach. So um, if uh, we are going to um, include in our systematic review several studies and we see that the study population considered by this different study is not too much heterogeneous, meaning we are including, for example, five studies and one is including only, only diabetic patients, one study is including only hypertensive patients, and one study is including only patients who had coronary artery disease, so we understand that the population is not, not too much heterogeneous. And if patients are not too much heterogeneous regarding intervention, interventions and other population characteristics, and if the studies that we are considering are not too much different regarding the sizes of the, of the study, meaning the number of patients including, we can consider to uh, pool the results of this study um, of these studies and to perform a um, meta-analysis. So it's important 
to perform a systematic review to check if the population is not too much heterogeneous and then to decide to go on with the meta-analysis. So what is a meta-analysis? It's a quantitative approach for systematically combining results of previous research to arrive at conclusions about the body of research. Of course, also meta-analysis have their um, protocols. Uh, this is PRISMA, and as it was with STROBE and with CONSORT, the um, PRISMA checklist reports all the aspects that should be considered when we are approaching to write a meta-analysis or a systematic review. It's very important and it's really helpful because we have information about how to write the background and how to write the methods, uh, how to report the inclusion, the exclusion criteria, how to report the literature search, and uh, how to report the statistical methods, and uh, also about the results and the discussion. There are different approaches to perform a meta-analysis. The one we usually, uh, uh, the meta-analysis we usually read are coming from um, um, are, are based on the frequentist approach, but there are also um, those considered by easy on approach. Then we have a network meta-analysis. These three types of meta-analysis are performed on uh, actually data extracted from published reports. Or we can have individual patients meta-analysis, meaning that uh, all, the individual, um, all the individual patient data uh, are considered for this kind of study. So in the frequent, in, let's see um, in few words, uh, actually uh, what the, 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 these different approach are. So in, when we consider a meta-analysis uh, designed according to the frequentistic approach, it, we just extract data from uh, published randomized uh, control trials. We use an, an, an analytic approach to pull the results of these studies, and uh, we perform statistical analysis. In the Bayesian approach, we, we don't just consider, actually, uh, the, the results of the studies that we are including in this, uh, this meta-analysis, but we also consider um, a priori information, for example, uh, data coming from other types of study, and this uh, this information is uh, somehow uh, considered when we perform statistical analysis. Then we have network meta-analysis. These are particularly useful when there are not studies directly comparing two drugs that we would like to uh, compare. For example, if we have study A, um, treatment A, B, and C, and we have uh, one study, um, more than one study, comparing study um, drug A with drug B, and uh, if we have some studies comparing uh, drug A with drug C, using the network meta-analysis approach, we will be able to compare um, using this, uh, I will say, transitive property, study B with st um, drug B with uh, drug C, actually. This is a very good example. This graph looks quite complex, but, uh, for example, if we have studies comparing all um, the different drugs, but uh, directly comparing all these different drugs, but uh, as you can see in this graph, there is no study comparing sertraline versus duloxetine, but we have a common comparator. We will be able, by a network meta-analysis, to get an indirect comparison between sertraline versus duloxetine. Um, of course, the quality of an individual patient's meta-analysis is much higher. In the individual ma patient's meta-analysis uh, um, can be considered as we, con let's have an example. For example, we have three trials. We want to do an individual patient meta-analysis using this trial on a particular topic. We contact the trialist. We get the, in the patient's information of all these three trials, meaning not the mean age of the population or the total number of events in each trial, 
but we will get all the data about each patient included in each of this trial. So at the end, we will have something like a big database including all the three databases coming from these trials, and then we will be able to perform statistical analysis on this big population. This is an individual patient data meta-analysis, and it allows us to perform a time to event an analysis that it's not possible to perform when we have an aggregated data meta-analysis, to perform subgroup analysis, to have a more flexible analysis of outcome, and to ensure quality of randomization and follow-up analysis. Tomorrow we will uh, see together how to design a meta-analysis and how to do statistical analysis and which are the statistical issues that should be considered when we approach this kind of studies. Thank you very much for your attention.